Okay, everyone, let's get started. First of all, I want to thank all of you for being here today. We have a lovely turnout, and unfortunately, I think it's not to see me, but it's to see our distinguished guest. So thank you very much for being here. As a brief introduction for myself, my name is Stephen Fleischer. I am one of the co-directors of Africa in the Moot, as well as one of the founders of the organization. And it is my pleasure to be here to host this next lecture in our lecture series. Before moving forward, I want to do a quick shout out to the Educational Committee of Africa in the Moot for helping to organize these lovely lectures. We have really had an unbelievable group of arbitration practitioners, arbitration academics to speak to us. And I am very grateful to all the hard work the Educational Committee has put in. Before moving on, I wanna just give a couple brief housekeeping rules. The first half of this session will be a lecture. So please do have your video cameras off and please also have your microphones muted. This will help with the audio connection. It'll also ensure that everyone can hear Professor Moses in her talk. At the end of the lecture, we are gonna open it up to some questions and answers. During that session, please do uh, use the raise hand feature on Zoom to indicate that you have a question and I'll do my best to call on you in the order that you've raised your hand. If you do have any issues using the raise hand feature, you can feel free to just um, type in your question in the chat. We would very much like, if possible, for you to turn on your camera and ask your question uh, out loud in the call. If that's not possible, that is quite all right, and we'll just uh, read your question out loud in the chat box. Now, without further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Margaret Moses. I was just joking with Professor Moses before we joined in on the call, and I said, me introducing you is a total waste of time, because everyone in this room, I'm 100% sure, has cited you many times in their memos and are preparing to cite you even more in their oral pleadings. But nonetheless, an introduction is coming. Professor Moses is the Director of International Law and Practice at Loyola University Chicago School of Law in the United States. She is an internationally recognized scholar in international commercial arbitration, and her treatise on international commercial arbitration is regularly cited as authority both in arbitrations as well as in many this moot memos and this moot pleadings alike. She continues to act as an arbitrator under the auspices of the International Chamber of Commerce, the Court of Arbitration, and the American Arbitration Association's International Center for Dispute Resolution, to name just a few. Additionally, and as a very fun fact, Professor Moses continues to teach international commercial arbitration and founded the Vismut program at Loyola Chicago. And one of her favorite students was none other than yours truly, myself, who sat in her class not so long ago. Uh, so without further ado, Professor Moses, let me pass it along to you. Thank you so much for donating your time to talk to all of our many students. And we really look forward to hearing your lecture. Well, thank you, Stephen, for that very nice introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, good to be with you today. I'm going to be talking about choosing the proper law of the arbitration clause. Now, the reason we need to talk about this is because most parties, when they draft an arbitration clause, do not choose a law to govern the arbitration clause itself. They generally choose a law to govern the main contract. For example, they might say, um, this contract is governed by the law of Switzerland. So why wouldn't the law of Switzerland also govern the arbitration clause, assuming this is the case where the arbitration clause is one of the clauses in the commercial contract? Well, Swiss law might govern the arbitration clause, but there's also another law that might be found to govern the arbitration clause. When parties draft an arbitration clause, they generally choose the seat of the arbitration. And as you know, the seat is the place where the arbitration will be held. And courts and tribunals have generally found that when parties choose a particular jurisdiction as the seat, that jurisdiction's arbitration laws will govern the procedural aspects of the arbitration. That jurisdiction's law is referred to as the lex arbitri or the law of arbitration. It's also referred to as the curial law 
So there are two possible laws that might govern the arbitration clause when the parties did not choose a specific law to govern it. The law the parties chose to govern the main contract or the law of the seat. So if the parties did not specifically choose a law to govern the, arbitra the arbitration clause, an arbitral tribunal, when it has to interpret that clause, will have to decide what law to rely on. Is it the substantive law chosen by the parties to govern the main contract, or is it the law of the seat, that is the lex arbitri, or the curial law of the seat chosen by the parties? So just so we are clear, let's consider some examples of issues that might come before a tribunal where it would need to determine what law it should apply to the arbitration clause. All right, here's example one. The issue is whether the arbitration clause can be interpreted as providing the tribunal with the power to adapt the contract. The law of country A has been chosen as the law governing the main contract. Country B, law of country B has been chosen, well, country B has been chosen as the seat. And so there is a presumption that the lex arbitri of country B governs the arbitral proceedings. If the tribunal selects the law of country A to govern the interpretation of the arbitration agreement, it will have the power to adapt the contract. But if it finds that the law of the seat governs its interpretation of the arbitral clause, it will not have the power to adapt the contract. Although the lex arbitri of country B says nothing about the tribunal's power to adapt a contract, the contract law of country B would not allow adaptation. In order to resolve the issue, the tribunal has to choose what law governs the arbitration agreement. So you can see that very important matters can turn on what law governs the arbitration agreement. Now, example two, the issue is whether the arbitration clause is invalid because the law of country A, which governs the main contract, requires an additional consent which has not been given. Country B is the seat. If the law of country A is chosen to govern the validity of the arbitration clause, there will be no arbitration because country A's law says the arbitration in clause is invalid without an additional consent. And that consent was not given. If the lex arbitri of country B governs the validity of the arbitration clause, then the arbitration will be enforced. We will come back to these two examples after we consider what policies and practices guide the decision maker, decision making of arbitrators on these issues. But I wanted you to understand that there are many different and important issues that are determined by the specific law governing the arbitration clause. Some of those issues include the formation, existence, scope, validity, legality, interpretation, termination, effects, and enforcement of the arbitration clause. So a lot of potential issues. So I wanted you to understand what an important function the law of the arbitration clause can have. And now I wanna talk about the following. First, what are some possible solutions to this problem? Second, what does the doctrine of separability have to say about the law that should govern the arbitration agreement? Three, what are the primary reasons that courts and tribunals give for choosing one law over another? And four, why I think there is a better way to proceed than just saying that either the law of the main contract or the law of the seat should govern the arbitration clause. And so I will propose a new framework for considering how to choose the proper law of the arbitration clause. Let's begin though with some possible and sort of obvious um, solutions. Um, to begin, the problem caused by this issue today is that when parties do not choose a law that specifically to specifically govern the arbitration agreement, a tribunal is frequently called upon to resolve the issue by selecting the appropriate governing law. And different tribunals frequently issue decisions that are inconsistent and unpredictable. 
Okay, so there, is, there are some easy and obvious solutions. The parties could, for example, simply insert a clause into their arbitration agreement, choosing the law governing the agreement. Now I'm using arbitration clause and arbitration agreement interchangeably here because we're dealing with a situation where the arbitration agreement is embedded as a clause in the main contract. The model clause of the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, HKIAC, encourages parties to choose a specific law for the arbitration, to, to choose a specific law for the arbitration clause. In its model clause, the HKIAC has certain optional provisions, one of which is the law of the arbitration clause shall be, and that's a blank for you to fill in. A suggestion for filling in the blank follows in parentheses, Hong Kong law. Um, the value, so, so the Hong Kong uh, Arbitration Center wants you to choose a law, Hong Kong law or some other law, as a specific law governing your arbitration clause. Now, the value that is added by this provision of the HKIC IAC model clause is that it would eliminate uncertainty as to which law applies to the arbitration agreement. And as a result, it would increase efficiency of the proceedings and avoid unnecessary debate about the appropriate law. Another possible solution is that of the Australian Center for International Commercial Arbitration. That's ASICA, A-C-I-C-A. -A. The ASICA Arbitration Rules of 2016 adopted the following default rule. The law of the seat shall be the governing law of the arbitration agreement unless the parties have expressly agreed otherwise. Thus, in an arbitration under the ASICA rules, if parties do not choose a law governing the arbitration clause, the tribunal will apply the law of the seat. This means fewer uncertainties and a higher level of efficiency. It does, of course, limit the discretion of the tribunal in cases where the law of the seat might not be the best choice. For example, if the law of the seat would render the arbitration clause invalid. Despite the fact that parties could take steps to avoid the problem of which law governs the arbitration clause, most do not. As a result, it will often fall, fall to the tribunal to determine what the law of the arbitration clause will be. So what does the doctrine of separability have to say about this question? One of the most important doctrines affecting this question of the proper law of the arbitration clause is the doctrine of separability. An arbitration clause embedded in a contract is frequently referred to as an arbitration agreement. This stems from the fact that despite its position as one contractual clause among many, the arbitration clause is considered for some purposes to be a separate agreement from the main contract. The purpose of having a presumption of separability is so that the arbitrator's power will not be short-circuited by a defect in the main contract. If one party challenges the main contract on a ground of validity, this will not necessarily undermine the arbitrator's power to resolve the party's dispute. A tribunal constituted under the arbitration agreement could still determine the question of whether the main contract was valid and what rights and obligations of the parties were under that contract. Thus, in most instances, as long as the arbitration clause itself is not challenged, under the separability doctrine, the arbitrator is still empowered to decide the dispute. Such power is not necessarily diminished by an assertion, for example, that the main contract has been induced by fraud or is illegal. Thus, the separability doctrine is supposed to protect the expectations of the parties that their arbitration agreement will permit arbitration as they intended, even if there are defects in the main contract their arbitration agreement will serve as the method by which the party's dispute is resolved. 
The basic presumption of the separability of the arbitration agreement from the main contract is longstanding and widely accepted and has been incorporated into arbitration laws, rules, and practice. However, there is a basic disagreement over the purposes for which the clause is independent. Is the arbitration agreement independent for the sole purpose of permitting the arbitrators to have jurisdiction despite challenges to the validity of the main contract? Or is the arbitration agreement a completely distinct, independent, and autonomous agreement for other purposes as well? There are some French cases, for example, that suggest that the arbitration agreement is completely separate from the main contract, stating, for example, that the arbitration agreement has a validity and effectiveness of its own. In other jurisdictions, references to the separability presumption make clear that the independence of the arbitration agreement is viewed narrowly. For example, the English Arbitration Act 1996 states that when an arbitration clause is part of another contract, the arbitration clause remains valid despite any invalidity in that other contract and, quote, shall for that purpose be treated as a distinct agreement. Now, no other purpose in the English Arbitration Act, no other purpose is suggested for having an independent arbitration agreement, just the purpose of being considered independent when the main contract is challenged for validity. Switzerland and Japan have laws with similar provisions. So why does this matter with respect to determining the law of the arbitration clause? Well, if the separability doctrine is viewed narrowly, that is, it only exists to preserve the arbitration clause when there's an alleged defect in the main contract, then it really has no relevance as to what law governs the arbitration clause. This would tend to lead to a result that since for most purposes, the arbitration clause is just another clause in the contract, then the choice of law to govern the main contract should also govern the arbitration clause. On the other hand, if the arbitration agreement is a separate agreement for all purposes, then the analysis of what law applies is arguably a question that should be resolved by a separate complex of laws analysis. Courts and commentators have found that when an arbitration agreement is viewed as a completely different and separable agreement, then the law chosen to govern the main contract has little to say about the arbitration agreement. In England in 2020, in the case of Inca v. Chubb, we see a court of appeal decision that favored the law of the seat, which was reversed as to its rationale by the UK Supreme Court, although the higher court, in this case, ultimately also chose the law of the seat as the governing law of the arbitration clause. Both cases considered the accepted common law choice of law rule, which involved first determining whether the parties made an express choice of law, or if not, was there an implied choice of law? And if not, then what was the system of law with which the arbitration agreement had, quote, its closest and most real connection, citing a case called Sulamerica v. Anessa for this basic common law rule. The Inca case involved a dispute over liability for a fire that had occurred in a construction of a power plant in Russia. The insurer, Chubb, paid the insurance claim of the owner and then brought a lawsuit in, Ru in Russia against Inca, a Turkish subcontractor who allegedly caused the fire. Inca, the Turkish company, responded by bringing an application for an anti-suit injunction in England. It wanted to stop Chubb's lawsuit in Russia, saying that Chubb was in breach of an arbitration agreement that was seated in London. 
no governing law had been expressly chosen to govern either the main contract or the arbitration clause. The Court of Appeal had to decide the proper law of the arbitration agreement to determine whether Chubb's claim in the Russian proceedings was within the scope of the arbitration agreement and whether anti-suit injunctive relief could be granted to stop Chubb's lawsuit and force it to arbitrate. Now the Inca Court of Appeal held that the law of the seat should govern the arbitration clause and found that the choice of London as the seat of the arbitration meant that the law of the arbitration agreement was English law. It regarded the party's choice of the law of the seat, which was London, to govern the arbitration agreement as a matter of implied choice by the parties. In the court's view, an express choice of the seat meant that there was an implied choice for the arbitration law of the seat, that is the lex arbitri or the curial law, to govern the arbitration agreement. The court supported its decision in large part by the overlap between the scope of the curial jurisdiction and the scope of the law governing arbitration agreement and found that it was, quote, natural to regard the choice of the former, the curial law, as the choice of the latter, the arbitration clause. The court had this to say about the separability doctrine. When parties choose the seat and therefore choose the curial law, then, quote, the arbitration agreement is treated as separate and severable for the purposes of this choice of curial law, about which the main contract has nothing to say. Thus it found that given the separate nature of the arbitration clause, there was no reason for the law governing the main contract to govern the arbitration clause. The Court of Appeal decision, if applied generally, would mean for the most part, whenever parties chose a seat, but not the law of the arbitration clause, the law of the arbitration clause would be the curial law of the seat. Now, the Inca Court of, Dis of Appeal decision was, however, remarkably short-lived. Approximately six months later, the UK Supreme Court found that when parties have not chosen a law to govern the arbitration agreement, a law chosen to govern the main contract will ordinarily govern the arbitration agreement. Nonetheless, the UK Supreme Court reached the same result as the Court of Appeal that in this case, the law governing the arbitration agreement was English law, the law of the seat, but on entirely different reasoning. The UK Supreme Court's lengthy and thoughtful opinion was evidently intended to establish some clarity and certainty for determining the law that should be applied to the arbitration agreement. Citing commentators, English cases, and international cases, the court stated, that as a general rule, the party's choice of law for the main contract should be construed as applying to the arbitration agreement. It supported this approach with practical reasons, saying it would help provide certainty and consistency, avoid complexities, uncertainties, and artificiality, and ensure coherence. The UK Supreme Court took issue with the Court of Appeals finding of a strong presumption that when parties have chosen the seat, they've impliedly chosen the arbitration law of the seat to govern the arbitration agreement. The Court of Appeal had found that the choice of law to govern the main contract had little to say about the arbitration agreement because it was directed to a separate and different agreement. But the Supreme Court, the UK Supreme Court, this put the principle of separability of the arbitration agreement too high. Like the Sul America Court, the UK Supreme Court observed that the rationale of the separability doctrine is to prevent a defect in the main contract from invalidating the arbitration clause. The court further stated that while the separability doctrine may make the arbitration agreement more amenable than other parts of the contract to the application of a different law, it does not follow that an arbitration agreement is generally to be regarded as different and separate from the rest of the contract. Thus, the UK Supreme Court held a narrow view 
of the separability doctrine. Um, it did not find that the separability presumption in any way favored a finding that the law of the seat is to be preferred to the law of the main contract for purposes of determining the law of the arbitration agreement. The UK Supreme Court ultimately reached its holding that the law of the arbitration agreement was English law by following the closest connection test. It could do so, however, only by first concluding that the parties did not choose a law to govern the main contract. So because the parties did not choose a law to govern the main contract, the law with the closest connection to the arbitration agreement was the law of the seat. With respect to separability, in the court's view, the separability doctrine provided no basis to prefer the Curia law or the Lex Arbitri of the seat as the law that would govern the, def the arbitration agreement. So what are the primary reasons um, that courts and tribunals give for choosing one law over the other? Well, we saw that the, the re in terms of the reasons prefer for preferring the law of the seat, we saw that the UK Supreme Court made very clear its view that as a general rule, absent a party choice of a law to govern the arbitration agreement, the chosen law for the main contract will also govern the arbitration agreement. However, that does not mean that other jurisdictions will necessarily follow this English rule. A number of courts and commentators have argued that if the parties do not choose a law to govern the validity of the arbitration clause, the default position is that the law of the seat will govern that question. Some have used the concept of separability as a basis for saying that if the arbitration clause and the main contract are indeed two separate contracts, the main contract's chosen law can have no application to the arbitration clause. Some commentators take the position that when parties choose a seat, they have demonstrated their intention that the entirety of the arbitration clause should be governed by the law of the seat. They view the choice of the seat as equivalent to or should be regarded as an express choice of the law of the seat for the arbitration agreement. Another reason that has been offered for choosing the law of the seat is based on the New York Convention or on the UNCTRAL Model Law of Arbitration. The convention and the model law both contain language stating that the enforcement of an award may be refused or an award set aside if, quote, the arbitration agreement is not valid under the law to which the parties have subjected it, meaning under the law that the parties chose to govern the arbitration agreement. And of course, parties don't do that very often. Um, so under the law where the, to which the parties have subjected it or failing in the, any indication thereon, under the law of the country where the award was made. Well, the law of the country where the award was made is of course the seat. So they're saying the law of the seat. So this language is saying either apply the law that was chosen for the arbitration clause, and parties don't usually choose a law to govern the arbitration clause, or if no law was chosen, then it's the law of the seat. Although the provisions in the New York Convention and Model of Law apply to a challenge to an award based on whether the underlying arbitration agreement was valid, there are strong reasons for concluding that the same standard should be used to determine the validity of the arbitration agreement when it is challenged at the beginning of the arbitral process. Of course, even if one accepted as a default position that the law of the seat was the proper law to determine the validity of the arbitration agreement, the language quoted above from the convention and the model law um, only applies to validity of the arbitration agreement and not to a myriad of other issues that could flow from the arbitration agreement. Nothing in the law suggests that all such issues, including, for example, issues of contract formation or interpretation, should be decided solely under the law of the seat. A finding that the law of the seat governs the substantive aspects of the arbitration agreement also not uncommonly results from a choice of law analysis where the court or tribunal determines that the law of the seat is, quote, more closely connected 
to that of the arbitration agreement. But one of the problems with using the closest connection as a basis for choosing the law of the seat to govern the arbitration agreement is that the specific reasons offered by various courts and tribunals tend to be somewhat vague. Gary Bourne has commented on this practice as follows. The courts and tribunals applying a closest connection analysis typically recite various connecting factors in an effort to select one or the other factor as that having the closest connection with the arbitration agreement. The resulting choice is often arbitrary and unpredictable. There is seldom any principled basis for concluding that the choice of the arbitral seat is or is not a more meaningful connection or a better indicator of the party's intentions than the law chosen to govern the underlying contract. Now, one of the specific reasons offered by courts and tribunals for finding the closest connection exists between the arbitration agreement and the seat of the arbitration is that the place where the arbitration will be held is the one which will exercise supporting and supervisory jurisdiction necessary to ensure the procedure is effective. However, some have simply found that the arbitration agreement has the closest and most real connection with the law of the seat because the arbitration is being held in the seat. So those are some of the reasons that courts and tribunals give for preferring the law of the seat. But what about reasons for preferring the law in the main contract? Well, we know that the UK Supreme Court decided in the Inca case that generally the law governing the main contract should govern the arbitration clause and that this would help provide certainty, consistency, um, avoid complexities, uncertainties, and artificiality, and ensure coherence. Moreover, jurisdictions in addition to the English courts have found that the law of the main contract is a better choice to be the governing law of the arbitration agreement. In the US, the restatement of the law of international commercial and investor state arbitration, although noting a lack of international consensus, takes the position that in determining the proper law of the arbitration agreement, absent party choice, one should first look to the law chosen for the main contract. And only if there has been no such selection should the choice be the law of the seat. Although the restatement provisions are set forth within the context of determining the law of the arbitration agreement at the time of enforcement of an award, and although the restatement is essentially providing guidance for an enforcing court, nonetheless, the reasoning is analogous to what a tribunal would consider in determining the law of an arbitration agreement. The restatement provides as follows. In determining the validity of the arbitration agreement, a court applies the law to which the parties have subjected the arbitration agreement. Okay, if the parties chose a law governing the arbitration agreement, that law should be applied. Or if no such law has been selected by the law identified in the general choice of law clause in the underlying contract, or in the absence of such a clause by the law of the seat of arbitration. Thus the reporters reject the position that absent an express choice of law for the arbitration agreement, the New York Convention and Model Law require the law of the seat as the default choice. In addition, there's another important reason why the substantive law of the contract might, in some instances, be the better choice for the law of the arbitration agreement. There may be issues of contract law rather than arbitration law, which need to be effectively resolved in accordance with the law of the arbitration agreement. Because the parties chose a law to govern substantive issues in the main contract, their choice should prevail with respect to issues such as contract law-based issues, which would not be included within a jurisdiction's lex arbitri. I want to go back now to the two examples we mentioned at the beginning of the talk and see how they might be decided by a tribunal. And as I told you, I'm going to propose a new framework for deciding what law should govern an arbitration agreement. But first, I want to briefly mention the difference in the substantive law chosen by the parties to govern the main contract and the lex arbitri or the curial law of the seat. So first, the substantive law of the contract. This is the law that the parties exercising their autonomy choose 
to govern their rights and obligations under the contract. It is normally chosen by the parties to be the national law of one of them, or in a sale of goods contract, it may be an international law such as the CISG. So this is the law that determines the merits of the case, the substantive issues that are disputed between the parties. Now, what about the mostly procedural law of the arbitration? The Lex Arbitri is mostly procedural, but it has some substantive aspects. Um, and the procedural law is typically the law of the seat, even though the parties rarely state this expressly in the arbitration clause. Rather, they say they choose a seat. And the parties, the party's choice of the seat is understood as an expectation that courts in that jurisdiction which have supervisory authority over the proceedings will apply their own jurisdiction's arbitration law to carry out that responsibility. Thus choosing a seat creates a presumption that the lex arbitri will apply to the arbitral proceedings. So what are the issues dealt with by the lex arbitri? Well, things like the requirements for a valid arbitration agreement, number of arbitrators, appointment of arbitrators, grounds to challenge an arbitrator, power of the arbitral tribunal, conduct of the hearings, the witnesses, basically laws that govern how the arbitration will be carried out. But there are other issues that do not deal with arbitral proceedings that need to be determined by the arbitration clause. These issues may include things like interpretation of the arbitration clause, remedies for breach, adaptation, or reformation of the contract. So I'm going to propose a new framework for deciding which law should apply to the arbitration clause when parties have not made that choice. And then we will apply that new framework to the two examples we discussed earlier in this talk. I think it is time to take another look at whether the decision on the law applicable to the arbitration clause requires a completely binary choice. Either the law of the main contract applies to all the substantive issues or the law of the seat governs them. A more logical approach would be to focus on the issues at stake with respect to arbitration agreement and determine the law most appropriate for those specific issues. To arrive at this new framework, the first step would be to accept the position that the doctrine of separability has no function with respect to determining what law should govern the arbitration agreement and should be deemed irrelevant to that purpose. Thus, if the separability doctrine is limited to situations where there's a challenge to the validity of the main contract, then for all other purposes, the arbitration clause is simply one clause of the main contract. So I propose that a tribunal should refrain from creating a rigid and in effect, what I consider a false dichotomy by deciding that either all substantive issues flowing from the arbitration agreement should be governed by the law of the main contract or that all issues should be governed by the law of the sea. Rather, a tribunal should focus on the specific issue that must be resolved. It should give deference to the autonomy of the parties when they chose the law of the main contract and when they chose the law of the seat and apply the most appropriate law with respect to the specific matter in dispute. The tribunal should engage from, in, should refrain from engaging what, what is effectively a fiction that the parties chose one of the two laws to govern all these issues arising from the arbitration agreement when they did not. Instead, if a particular issue is within the scope of the Lex Arbitri, the tribunal should apply the law of the seat. If not, it should apply the law of the main contract. In following the party's actual choices, the tribunal could decide that certain issues arising under the arbitration agreement are governed by the law of the seat and other issues are governed by the law of the main contract. In other words, if the issue is one that's clearly covered by the Lex Arbitri, then that law the law of the seat should govern the particular issue. If the issue is one that is not covered by the Lex Arbitri, such as a contract issue or an issue of interpretation, then the law chosen for the main contract should govern that issue. Now consider the first example we mentioned in the beginning of this talk. 
where the issue is whether the arbitration clause could be interpreted as providing the tribunal with the power to adapt the contract. If the tribunal applied the law of country A, whose law the parties had chosen to govern the main contract, the tribunal would have the power to adapt the contract. But if it decided that the law of the seat governed its interpretation of the, arbitral, of the arbitration clause, then it would not have the power to adapt the contract. Now, the lex arbitri of the seat says nothing about adaptation of a contract, but its contract law does not permit adaptation. In order to resolve the issue, the tribunal has to choose what law governs the arbitration agreement. Now, in applying the new framework, you would first look at the lex arbitri, that is the law of arbitration in the sea. In this case, because the lex arbitri does not deal with the question of arbitration, of, uh, the question of adaptation of the contract, but its contract law prohibits adaptation, then the choice really is between the contract law chosen by the parties or the contract law of the sea, not the lex arbitri of the sea. There does not appear to be a good argument for applying the contract law of the seat, which was a jurisdiction where neither party had any connection other than a place where their arbitration would be held. Would be held. So then the law the parties actually chose to govern the main contract should govern the arbitration clause and the tribunal should have the power to adapt the contract. Although there is a presumption that arbitration law of the seat governs arbitration proceedings, <coughs> sorry, there is no expectation by the parties that other laws of the seat should govern issues related to contracts, particularly when the parties have chosen a law to govern their contract. <coughs> so the second example, dealt with a question of validity. Under the laws of the seat, <coughs> the arbitration clause is valid. However, under the law of the main contract, the arbitration agreement is not valid because under that law, there's an additional consent that is needed that was not provided. Under the new framework, you look first to the Lex Arbitri to see if it clearly governs the issue. And if so, you apply the law of the seat. In this case, um, excuse me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with a cough drop to see if I can control this cough. So excuse me just a second. All right, under the new framework, you look first to the Lex Arbitri to see if it, is, see if it clearly governs the issue. And if so, you apply the law of the seat. In this case, the law of the seat would find the arbitration agreement valid. And this clearly meets the expectations of the parties that they will be able to arbitrate consistently with the Lex Arbitri. So even though the law of the main contract would require an additional consent, in this case, the Lex Arbitri governs validity and should be applied to determine the validity of the arbitration clause. Now, um, we have seen this issue a bit in the current discipline problem. There, the Lex Arbitri and Danubia would find the arbitration agreement valid, but the, but the law of the main contract, Equatoriana, has a provision in its constitution that requires another approval, that is parliamentary approval. There are, of course, additional facts and a number of arguments that can be made on both sides, as you know. For example, both parties knew in advance of the requirement of the parliamentary approval, which undermines somewhat a claim that the law of the seat would meet the expectations of the parties. Nonetheless, as I'm sure you found in your research, there are a number of arguments that support the application of the law of the seat and a number of others that support the law of the main contract. So even though using the new framework as a first step, may not always provide a clear bright line solution as to which law governs the arbitration clause. Nonetheless, thinking about the question on an issue by issue basis, rather than making an artificial declaration that all issues interpreting the law of arbitration clause 
should be decided either by the law of the sea or by the law of main contract would provide, I believe, a more certain and predictable solution to the problem. Thank you. Professor Moses, thank you so much. That was so particularly um, connected to the Vismuth problem. And I think it's gonna be a gigantic help for the students as they continue to prepare for their oral pleadings and continue to tweak their arguments. So um, everyone, like I mentioned, we're gonna now move this over to the question and answer portion of the talk. So please just let me know if you have a question by raising your hand and then I'll call on you. If you're comfortable, please turn on your video if possible to ask your question. If not, you're welcome to uh, leave your video off. And I see we already have a question from John. So John, feel free. Um, afternoon, everyone. Uh, evening, everyone. Um, John here. Um, it's a pleasure to see you again, Professor Margaret Moses, and to, yes, nice to, see you your, too. <laughs> to listen to another of your insightful lectures. Um, I've listened to the approach that you're proposing. I mean, quite unique, at, at least to me. And I have a question slightly veering away from the approach you're proposing. And my question is, do you think domestic law has something to say in relation to resolving this conflict? Because in my mind, it seems like a simpler solution would be if I'm the legislator here in Kenya and I have an opportunity to amend the Arbitration Act here in Kenya, I would simply say that if you choose um, Kenya as the seat, or if you choose the law of Kenya as the seat or as the lex arbitri, then in instances where there is a dispute as to what law applies in relation to the arbitration agreement, then say, I guess, the lex arbitri applies. And I'm wondering if an approach like that makes sense for, for lack of a better expression. I'm not sure I quite understand your question. Could you, could you rephrase it a bit? I mean, I understand, you know, Lex Arbitri is the domestic law, so it definitely would have an impact. I mean, the whole point of having the Lex Arbitri is that you want the, the courts in the, in the seat to be able to, to exercise their own jurisdiction using their own law. But I'm not sure what the question, I didn't quite so, understand the question. So as I understand the conflict here is, we're trying to determine what law applies to the arbitration agreement. Right. Um, and your the propose the the approach you're proposing is that instead of having this artificial bifurcation, let's go to the kind of issue. And depending on the kind of issue, then we decide whether it's the lex arbitri or the law governing the contract that will apply in relation to that specific issue. So right. my question, so my question is, so if for example we have parties to an arbitration agreement and they have chosen Kenya as the seat. Right. And there's ambiguity as to what law applies. Uh, uh, what law applies in relation now to the arbitration agreement? Supposing the, the 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 law of the seat here said that if you choose Kenya as the seat, then and there is a question as to what law applies in relation to the arbitration agreement, then our law applies. So I'm wondering whether an approach like that would make sense, at least in in resolving such a conflict. Wait, are you saying that that whatever the law is, that the law, whether it's the Lex Arbitri or whether it's contract law, that whatever the law of the seat is, it should be applied? Is that is that your question? No, I'm saying, supposing the seat had legislation saying yeah. that if you choose us as if you choose Kenya as the seat, and there is ambiguity as to what law applies in relation to the arbitration agreement, then our law automatically applies. Whether an approach like that would be useful for purposes of solving the conflict. Oh, okay. Um, I, th I think it's likely that if, the, if, the, if Kenya said, uh, if you choose us as the seat, our, well, it depends on the, what the legislation said. I mean, is the, is the legislation gonna say, if you choose us as the seat, our lex arbitri and our substantive law are going to apply to any uh, any ambiguity in the um, in the uh, arbitration agreement. Is that is that what you're saying? 
because there's a difference between the lex arbitri, which is just the law of arbitration, right? I mean, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a reason why you would expect a, law, a, a country to apply its own, um, its own arbitration law to the proceedings in the, you know, the proceedings that are being held in its jurisdiction. You don't, you know, you want them to be able to make decisions about it. But the, but but you're saying we that could can you make legislation that said, in case of any ambiguity, all of our law, not just the lex arbitri, but any law in in Kenya is going to be applied to resolve that that um, ambiguity. Is that is that the question? Well, I'm yes. So I'm wondering, yes, so I'm wondering whether approaches like that would be useful in for purposes of solving this question on what law applies in relation to the arbitration agreement. Um, well, I yeah, I it, it might it it might possibly resolve it. I mean, um, assuming that the parties understood when they you know that that was what they were doing um, that, that when they agreed that to a seat in Kenya, they were agreeing to Kenyan law. I, 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 I think it could possibly be enforceable. I don't think it would necessarily be a good, a good law to have, and it might discourage people from wanting to arbitrate there if they really knew how it worked. Because the normal process is that the Lex Arbitri governs. But so, I mean, why should other laws in Kenya govern? I mean, you got two parties, let's say that the two parties have chosen Kenya as a neutral forum because neither one of them is from is from Kenya. Okay, they're from two other countries. So why should other laws of Kenya affect these two parties since they have no they have no connection to Kenya other than they having their juris their their seat there. So I, I think it would be unpopular with other with people who wanted to arbitrate to have Kenya say every single one of our laws is going to apply if there's any ambiguity, not just our Lex Arbitri. Because they, they, those parties have no connection to Kenya. Why should, they have no reason to think that their contract should be affected by, by Kenyan law. Their contract, they've chosen a law to govern their contract. So I think you could do it. I, I, it might be enforced, but I don't think it would be a good idea. I mean, well, you're yeah. going to have the, the, the Lex Arbitri is going to be enforced, right? Because that's, you know, and, and that, I'm saying, why isn't that really enough? Why do you need to have more than that? Yeah. Well, yeah, makes sense. But I mean, I guess what I have in my mind is that we could have wording to say that it's only going to apply in instances where um, there's ambiguity. But I do get your concerns on the um, popularity of it. Thank you. John, Thank fantastic. You. Thank you so much for that question. I see we have another question from Abigail. So Abigail, feel free to uh, jump in and ask your question, please. Sure, thanks, Stephen. Hi, Professor. I must say it's very lovely to have you here. So my question is regarding a situation where the parties have actually expressed what law they want to govern the arbitration agreement. So there is an express choice of law governing the arbitration agreement. Would the tribunal consider the law of the state, the lex arbitri, in determining the validity of the arbitration agreement, or would it be excluded completely, or would both of them apply in tandem? Ah, uh, good, good question. Um, all right, so let's say they choose a law to govern the arbitration agreement. Um, and it's the law of one of the two countries, we'll say. Um, I don't think, usually the law, when the, you choose a law to govern the arbitration agreement, you're, you're really talking about substantive issues of the arbitration agreement, right? Um, and so I think the Lex Arbitri would still apply to all the procedural issues. Um, there might be a question about, uh, you know, if there was a substantive issue also covered by the Lex Arbitri, then you might get into a dispute about, and, and if they would be resolved differently, um, then you might get into a dispute. But basically, if you choose a law, like you say, Hong Kong law is going to govern the arbitration clause, it doesn't mean that it's gonna undermine the Lex Arbitri for the procedural issues. 
Does that answer your question? Abigail, just confirm. You can hear me. Now we can. Yes, go ahead, Abigail. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just so, for a moment I couldn't hear you, but I got uh, your response. So if if the validity of the arbitration agreement, there is yeah. uh, a procedural issue, for example, would right. this be resolved by the arbitrary, and then a substantive issue to do with the validity be resolved by the actual law that has been chosen by the parties? I think so, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Right. Thanks, Abigail. So I think our next question is from Sheena. Sheena, you can go ahead. And then we have one question in the chat, which we'll uh, ask subsequently. So Sheena, over to you. Um, thank you so much, Professor, once again. Um, my question actually has to do with something that came up when you were answering John's question. Um, so we say that if you choose a law to apply in the interpretation of the arbitration agreement, for example, the law of Kenya. So if there's a particular provision in the constitution of Kenya um, requiring specific regulations to be met for such a contract to be valid, would the constitution of Kenya be included in what we refer to as the law of Kenya? So if the parties choose the law of Kenya, are they choosing only the arbitration law or are they also choosing the other laws that may affect the arbitration law? What they're saying is they, the law of Kenya shall govern the arbitration clause. Um, and what's and the seed is someplace else, right? Um, well, even even if it's just expressly in okay in this scenario, it's an express choice that the law of Kenya governs the arbitration agreement. So, right. um, is that only specific to the arbitration laws of Kenya, or does it also include the constitution of Kenya that may affect um, how the arbitration act is? enforced or is it just the arbitration act to the exclusion of all other laws in Kenya? Uh, let me just make sure I have this straight. Okay, the, um, the law, the arbitration clause is specifically Kenyan law, but the seat is somewhere yes. else, right? Let's say the seat is, is somewhere else. So you've got, so you're dealing with somewhere else as the possible Lex Arbitri. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we, we still have the Lex Arbitri, but we've got a law of the arbitration clause. The law, of, I think when you choose the law of the arbitration clause, you are again dealing with substantive issues. So the question of the constitution, whether the constitution, you know, that, that certainly, um, I mean, I, you know, we, we see this a little bit with the Vismu problem, right? The question of arbitration requiring approval and it, the approval not being given. So, um, but the, so the question is, is it, is it, um, is it gonna be, is it, will it be required? I mean, will that impose the, the arbitrate, the constitution on, on uh, finding validity? I think that's gonna, I think that's still pretty much up in the air. And if you've been, if you're part of the, involved with this mood, you know that there are a lot of arguments both ways about whether the, a, a constitutional provision can keep a, um, like that requiring an extra consent can actually be imposed in when a country is, uh, when a, uh, when the Lex Arbitri would find it valid. Um, I think it, it's something you're gonna have to fight about. I don't think that just saying that the constitution, that the law of, of the arbitration clause is, um, is Kenyan law, as opposed to having just the law of the main contract be Kenyan law. I'm not sure it gives you that much of an advantage. I mean, you, you, it, I think it's a, a case. It's again, you're gonna have to argue both sides. It might go both ways, either way. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sheena. So Professor Moses, we have a question on the chat that I can read to you. The question is, how far can the validation principle and estoppel 
force arbitration or a choice of law? And if it can, what can be done to fight these? Well, the validation principle is, of course, again, another principle that is uh, um, controversial. Um, some people think that it is the only and the best uh, way to decide something is that you choose the law that will make the make it valid. Um, but there are others that you know that disagree, and then that you that you can't just flag a um, parties don't have a, a judge can't decide well. I'm gonna make this valid because I'm gonna choose this law over that law. Um, I don't think that the validation principle is necessarily um, the answer to anything. I think it's got to be, um, I think that all of the facts and circumstances of each case have to be looked at. Um, and um, and this, the same with estoppel, it, it may work, it may not. I, I, don't, I don't think that there's a clear answer. It's, uh, that's just a, a typical lawyer lawyer problem. I mean, I know that um, I, I do talk about the validation principle in my article. I told, um, see in this talk that I've, um, the, the talk that I gave today is based on an article that I've written. And in the article, I deal with a, a, a little bit with the validation principle. That's just a whole nother topic um, to try to figure that out. Thanks so much, Professor Moses. And thank you, Xavier, for your question. Um, I don't see any more hands up or questions in the chat, but let me just give it a few seconds here. Does anyone else have any final questions for Professor Moses? This is a great opportunity for you to uh, ask someone who really knows her stuff some good questions. So I'll give you a, a couple moments. Uh, we have a long question from, from Jared. Jared, thank you very much for your question. Um, Professor Moses, I'll, I'll read it out to you as best I can. <laughs> Um, does the overlap between the validity and capacity legs of 51A, 342A4, not create a lowest hanging fruit scenario? If the arbitration agreement is valid under one of the possible laws applicable to it, but one of the parties lacked capacity under the laws governing its respective capacity, then what is the value in arguing about which law governs the arbitration agreement? I hope you can see this question as well, Professor, um, as it's a little bit of a longer one. Uh, I can't see it, no. Wait, let me see if I can find it in the chat. Yep, if you just click the chat button once, yeah, it should pop up I on the right. Okay. Well, that's a very, Jared, that's a very interesting question. I think I have to think about it some more, um, but I will think about it. Why don't you leave me your email and I'll let me think about it and maybe get back to you on it. That's very nice of you. Um, thanks so much, Professor. And Jared, you can, um, you're welcome to message me your email and I can pass it along if that's easier or, or potentially even just put it in the chat. Any other questions from anyone? You feel free to just type it in the chat or, or just to raise your hands. Great, fantastic. Well, I think then we can conclude um, this educational series lecture. And Professor Moses, I know I'm speaking from everyone in the room and on behalf of Africa in the Mood, I wanna thank you so much for taking the time to give this lecture and donating your time for all of us. It is incredibly helpful and it was especially uh, well connected to the Bismuth problem this year, which I know we are all battling between both on the respondent side of the arguments and the claimant side of the arguments. I think this gave us a lot of clarity. So thank you so very much. And uh, we look forward to keeping in touch. All right, thank you, Stephen. Pleasure to be thank here. Thanks, Professor. And everyone, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to seeing you at our next educational series. Thanks so much, everybody.